A good afternoon, I think we can start. Interestingly, that there are some faculty members who retired and still they come, whereas the residents don't have time to come, or they know it all. But it's very interesting observation. All right. The word gluten now became a buzzword everywhere. And the public is fascinated by it. Newspapers fuel it. And the media in general and the industry are around it. They benefit from it. So I hope in this presentation to sort this out. I have nothing to disclose relevant to this presentation. And my objective is to recognize the wheat-related illnesses, hopefully to avoid unjustifiable gluten-free diets that are prevailing, to differentiate between the three main illnesses caused by wheat, whether it is allergy or celiac disease, or the new entity, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, and to prescribe individualized management plans for patients with such disorders. These disorders mentioned can be wheat allergy, celiac disease, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, last but not least, the gluten madness that is prevailing. Now, wheat allergy is uh, not that common related to other food allergies affects about less than half percent of the population. But wheat is the most common cereal grain allergen compared to barley, rye, oat, and rice. The manifestations can be IgE-mediated like any food allergy affecting the GI, skin, respiratory, and even anaphylaxis. Not as common as the peanuts the tree nuts, the fish, and particular shellfish. There's an entity of wheat allergy that is the postprandial exercise induced anaphylaxis. Only the combination of the food, particularly the wheat, and the exercise will do it. Sometimes even a third factor come with it for the problem to happen, but each of these individual factors by itself will not do any harm. And the special entity of Baker's asthma. The type of the immune response in wheat allergy and the triggering a specific wheat allergen partially define the clinical manifestation. So IgE-mediated reactions are most commonly seen in children and usually resolve in a few years except the wheat-dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis, which is more in adults. The allergy can occur by smelling the allergen, not just for wheat, but many others. In fact, wheat is much less than other foods. Fish that's fried or boiled would be more, but even peanuts, that's why some Schools or flights are banning peanuts from the environment. And the special entity of Baker's asthma, these are the Baker's staff who are exposed to the wheat and certain allergen in the wheat. The alpha amylase trypsin inhibitor, in particular for this peculiar entity. These patients can eat all the wheat without any problem, but by inhalation will have the problem. And the wheat-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis is mainly caused by a certain protein, the omega-5 gliadin. The diagnosis of the wheat allergy is mainly by history about typical symptoms, and to ask about factors particularly in relationship to exercise or the occupation 
Many patients don't know what they are allergic to. So we do testing either skin testing or specific Ig in the serum. But these positive tests tell us there are IgE antibodies, meaning sensitization, not necessarily clinical allergy. So these tests, we don't say to the patient, you are allergic, but you are positive. You may be and may not be. These are screening tests. Confirmation will require a careful, well-designed challenge to be safe to the patient. The management of wheat allergy is simply elimination like any food allergy. And this patient may be able to tolerate other cereal grains. Symptomatic treatment whenever they get accidental exposure, including epinephrine auto-injector in cases of severe systemic reactions. And they will outgrow it, particularly in children, so periodically may be changed unless accidental exposure happened and determined whether the person is still reactive or not. Potential immunotherapy protocols are still in progress. At the present time, there is no immunotherapy for food allergy, but in the near future, within a few years, that current protocols probably will be applicable starting with the more allergenic foods like the peanuts and tree nuts and milk and egg. There is a species of uh, grain which is ancestor of wheat does not have the omega-5 gliadin, so it will be possible as a substitute for the wheat-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis. This is an intriguing entity that the anaphylaxis, although sometimes be limited to urticaria, generalized urticaria, or asthma, only when the patient exercises within a couple of hours of eating the food, the onset of symptoms can be delayed for several hours. The mechanism is not clearly known, but Ig is involved in it. But why, when the wheat or the food is eaten by itself, does not cause any difficulty, there must be other immunologic mechanism involved. It can be caused by one food or multiple foods, either individually or more confusing, when it is only in combination. Because we sort out the foods one by one, and we may not discover it. It's just like a police detective try to interrogate each suspected criminal and say, could not do it, but together we'll do it. As I mentioned, the omega-5 gliadin is the most common allergen for this entity. We encountered a case several years ago, a teenager, had recurrent anaphylaxis since the age of 11 years whenever he strenuously exercised within one hour of eating wheat, usually treating the emergency department multiple times, but epinephrine auto-injector was not prescribed until the age of 14. So stage three years getting this problem has to run to the emergency department, fortunately he did not die in one of those attacks. And that was prescribed by a dermatologist when he saw him. And the dermatologist requested a specific IgE blood test for multiple foods that were turned out to be negative. However, wheat was not tested. The physician was not aware that wheat is the most common allergen for this entity. Recurrences happened and was using the auto-injector. At 16 years, one hour after eating a sandwich, he played basketball for one hour. Five hours later, while he was home alone, had generalized itching, and shortness of breath, yes, anaphylaxis. He called 911, but lost consciousness before talking to the person on the other side and before reaching his auto-injector on the other room. 
paramedics responded, so they broke the, the door and saved his life. Serum triptase, a marker of mass cell degranulation, was elevated two hours later. Skin prick testing for 42 foods was positive only to wheat to a remarkable degree. Because of this case, we recommended that since the duration can be longer than the usual couple of hours and it's unpredictable, it would be prudent for this patient to avoid the offending food totally, then not just to say, I will eat it and within two hours or three hours I exercise, or to avoid exercising for a longer duration, preferably six hours or more, in case a delayed reaction will occur, like in this situation. The second disease is the celiac disease, and I see James Morris here or other gastroenterologists. You can correct the James or comment at the end, or in the middle if you like stop my mistakes. It's a small bowel disorder linked to gram prolamin. These patients are shared between the allergist and the gastroenterologist because the person can say, when I eat wheat, I get this trouble. And the most common term for any adverse reaction, the person or the physicians can say, you must be allergic to that. Not every reaction is allergic. The offending protein in this situation is gluten in wheat, by far the most common, and similar proteins in other cereals, cicalins in the rye, cordelines in barley, and avenins in oat, which is tolerated by the majority of these patients. It has a rare prevalence, much rarer than wheat allergy certain geographic and racial distribution. In Northern Europe, particularly in Ireland, Scotland, has the highest, one in 300. It is low in the United States, about one in five to 10,000. And it's very rare in Chinese, Japanese, and Sub-Saharan Africa. The age of onset varies even among siblings mostly within months of introducing the gluten, but may be delayed to late adulthood, childhood, or during adulthood. Females outnumber the males about twice. The classic symptoms are malabsorption, diarrhea, flatulence, vomiting, abdominal distension, weight loss. The offending gluten or other cereal protein the quantity and severity vary from one patient to another. It's usually worse in children. The pathology shows intestinal villus atrophy, crept hyperplasia, and mucosal lymphocytic inflammation and flattening. IgA antibodies to endomysium and again is transglutaminase as positive in more than 95%. There is a relationship to genetic factors. The HLA haplotype DQ2 and DQ8 in almost 100% of patients compared to 40% in the general population. But there is high discordance among siblings even identical twins. The classic symptoms mentioned before, abdominal distension, anorexia, chronic diarrhea, failure to thrive or weight loss, irritability, muscle wasting. Non-classic symptoms can be in other systems, arthritis, after stomatitis, dental defects, dermatitis herpetiforms, iron deficiency, anemia, short stature. Comorbid conditions, many times the endocrinologist would discover this disease. See diabetes, thyroiditis, arthritis, primary biliary cirrhosis. Certain genetic syndromes have higher incidence in such patients. 
trisomy 21, Turner syndrome, Williams syndrome, IgA deficiency is high. Remember in the previous slide, I said IgA antibodies to endometrium transglutaminase will be positive in them. But if the patient has IgA deficiency, the serologic test will be useless. Neurologic and psychologic factors are present. Axia, depression, epilepsy, IgA nephropathies, low bone densities. Dermatitis herpetiformis is a peculiar skin rash. It occurs in up to 25% of celiac disease patients, and even it can precede the symptoms of celiac disease. Very prolific red to a shade of purple, papulovesicular lesions. More on larger body parts, particularly the buttocks and upper parts of the legs. While lesions heal, new lesions appear. But once healed, they leave purple marks for weeks or months. The biopsy of the skin show by immunofluorescence show very characteristic diagnostic granular deposit of IgA. Many patients don't have GI symptoms, yet 90% have some degree of intestinal damage. We tolerate, or these patients can tolerate some degree of gastrointestinal discomfort. Dapsone can offer short-term improvement until the disease is diagnosed and the gluten is avoided. Definitive treatment, of course, is the gluten-free diet. It takes maybe several weeks to a few months for the rash to disappear. The rash may recur on consuming even minute amounts of gluten. And this is various pictures of that rash. And the biopsy showed very characteristic granular deposition of the Ig along the dermoepidermal junction. This condition should be differentiated from a very similar terminology of another disease called dermatitis herpetiform. I don't know why the dermatologists don't choose easier terms than differentiate. And this is due to herpes simplex on the background of atopic dermatitis. See, like these patients, and then the gladin activates zonulin, which is a normal component in the skin, leading to damage of the interepithelial tight juncture. Therefore, that looseness in between the epithelia allow enzyme-resistant proline-rich gluten fragments to penetrate into the lamina propria and become deamidated by transglutaminase. The deamidated gluten become recognized by the antigen-presenting cells that have HLA, certain haplotypes, and presented to the T helper cells that is by activated and produce interferon gamma by the T helper one and the antibodies to transglutaminase and the gliadin by the TH2 cells. This illustrated here the zonulin in the junction between the epithelium of the intestine become destroyed, allowing the gluten enter and become deamidated and the good be engulfed by the antigen processing cell that have certain haplotype markers presented to the T cell that produces the, the cytokines by the T helper 1 or T helper 2. Gluten sensitivity is a spectrum. 
about one half of them have the classic celiac disease and about equal number have compensated latent gluten sensitivity they tolerated for years so should not be surprised why that adult who has been eating wheat for a long time did not was not diagnosed can be latent small fraction can have atypical symptoms or one my or mild symptom and certain fraction have dermatitis herpetiformes without even celiac disease. So again, we look for the classic GI and non-GI symptoms for the disease, or mild or monosymptomatic, or dermatitis herpetiformes, or atypical symptoms, are the compensated latent sensitivity that at any time can pop up. What makes it to pop up? The unmasking can occur by nutrient deficiency or by infection or systemic stress or malignancies and disturb the balance and the person becomes symptomatic. Is there a role for IgE or IgD? When I was a young guy, I was very <laughs> zealous to aiming that every disease in the world is allergy. So I was working in the lab with IgE and the IgD antibodies. Particularly since IgD is of unknown function. So unfortunately, we did not find a relationship. The study did not demonstrate a role for IgE in celiac disease. We found a little of IgD antibodies but we did not know the significance of that, and nobody reproduced it. This is just illustrates the findings. The total IgE was not with whether any children or adults or IgD either were the same. And looking for antibodies of the IgE type, the root wheat or alpha gliadin, there was no difference either. And the IgD, no difference either. When I entered into a debate in one of the meetings many years ago between a Swedish colleague who said celiac disease is a food allergy, and I said, no, it is not <coughs> allergy as much as, to my dismay, I wanted every disease to be allergy. So the clinical reaction to oral gluten challenge is not as rapid as acute, that's like acute urticaria or wheezing gonaphylaxis. Total Ig is normal. Skin testing is generally negative. Specific Ig antibodies in the serum also not elevated. So celiac disease is invariably permanent, whereas whereas wheat allergy is usually temporary within few years will be outgrown by avoidance. The diagnosis of celiac disease, in addition to the history, which can be very mild or unrevealing, serology is highly reliable. Chill A typing may be needed to support the findings. Biopsy is very typical. And if we need a gluten challenge, will be done. The serologic test mentioned that the IgA antibodies to endomysium has sensitivity close to 100% as well as specificity. IgA tissue transglutaminase, the same, high reliability. IgA to deamidated gliadin peptide is high, but not as the previous two. IgG deamidated gliadin peptide is not high sensitivity, but high specificity. So IgA to endometrium 
and transcranial kinesis have the highest diagnostic accuracy. IgG antibody to deamidated gliadin peptide is based in IgA deficient subjects because we cannot rely on the other three. IgA and IgG antigliadin tests have low diagnostic reliability. And all four antibody levels fall with treatment. Avoidance of gluten will improve these titers. And this four can be used in monitoring the compliance of the patient of the gluten-free diet. Some patients may have suggestive clinical features, but negative serology. Those who have selective IgA deficiency, that's why always IgA, total IgA, should be requested when these specific antibodies are requested. If it is low IgA, very low, the test is unreliable. Patients who are on a low gluten diet, they already, many people are avoiding gluten, justifiably or mostly unjustifiable. They have been avoiding, they feel good about it. So we may need to go for the HLA a couple of times. Also, we should consider in these patients who have negative serology of celiac disease, is it wheat allergy, the IG mediated type, or the new entity, the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or any of a large number of gastrointestinal diseases can have the same clinical symptoms and the even abnormal biopsy. When do we need HLA testing? These two haplotypes have high sensitivity, but low specificity, i.e. very high negative predictive value. If in a suspected person, the serology is not helpful in the gray zone, and these haplotypes are absent, this almost excludes celiac disease. Chile testing is useful in the seronegative patients with equivocal biopsy findings, patients who are already in gluten-free diet, patients with equivocal serology or histology, and patients with IgE deficiency and equivocal biopsy or IgG deaminated gliadin peptide. Who should be tested for celiac disease? I think patients with chronic or recurrent GI symptoms should not miss a chronic permanent illness. Failure to thrive, delayed puberty, short stature, psychiatric disorder, and this is probably the most neglected part. In fact, in children, their first improvement in them when gluten-free diet is initiated, that child is a nice child before anything else. Just the, the mood of the child become obviously better. <laughs> Unexplained chronic non-GI symptoms, persistent aphthostomatitis, dental enamel hypoplasia, idiopathic peripheral neuropathy, non-hereditary cerebellar ataxia, or recurrent migraine headache. So almost any specialist in medicine should suspect celiac disease. Patient with autoimmune disease, type 1 diabetes, thyroid diseases, arthritis. Patients with unexplained abnormal laboratory findings, iron deficiency anemias, folate or vitamin B12 deficiency, persistent elevation in serum aminotransferases. Testing may be considered in asymptomatic first-degree relatives of patients, since there is some genetic component. Maybe first-degree, not every relative, so that the yield can be worthwhile.
more evidence on a screening for celiac disease is needed before the task force can recommend for or against the screening people who don't have any signs or symptoms of conditions. So indiscriminate just general screening is not necessary. In the face of unclear evidence, doctors should use their clinical judgment when deciding whom to screen. The American College of Gastroenterology currently recommends people without symptoms be considered for testing if they have a first degree relative with the disease. The biopsy is very diagnostic and it's almost always required, although there are some arguments that say if the patient has typical symptoms and the person that avoided the gluten became well and we never took gluten back with the symptoms, do we really need the biopsy? Will James Morris say yes, not just to get some money, but that is their specialty teaching. But I, are, I can argue, so what else is going to do it? If the serology has more than 95% reliability, and the patient clinically improves. Exceptions. Patients with positive serology and biopsy proven dermatitis herpetiforms. This is very characteristic, the biopsy of the skin. First degree relative with typical symptoms, positive serology and HLA positivity, and definite improvement on gluten-free diet. There's controversies regarding repeat biopsy. How often do we need to do it? <laughs> say six to 24 months after beginning gluten-free diet to see that they return to normal. Or after gluten change, which is rarely done unless the gastroenterologists are doing it. Endoscopically, the didenal mucosa may appear atrophic with loss of folds contain visible fissures, nodular appearance, or the folds may be scalloped as in this image. Such finds are not universally present and may occur in other GI disorders as well. Various degrees of increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, villus damage, loss of villi, flat mucosa, and crypt hyperplasia are characteristic of this disease. The findings can be semi-quantitated, even particularly in research studies. There are some criteria by some authors and some quantitative histopathology according to the degree of the pathology and the number of intraepithelial lymphocytes. The diagnosis by biopsy plus serology is presumptive until symptoms improve in gluten-free diet. That's the key. The person did not improve on this, therefore differential diagnosis should be considered. Repeat biopsy to document histologic normalization is not always required and may not be completely normal in spite of clinical improvement, so it can be confusing. If the person improved, that's good enough. And that's the normal mucosa with the long villi and columnar epithelium, whereas in celiac disease are flattened, hyperplastic crypts, intraepithelial lymphocytes, and the columnar epithelium become cuboidal. They mentioned that the differential diagnosis is a lot, and that's the area of the gastroenterologist to look for other diseases, bacterial overgrowth, Crohn's disease, and many diseases then can resemble the celiac disease and cause similar histological changes. The treatment is avoiding food containing wheat, barley, rye, and oat, although many patients can't tolerate oat, is not as offensive as the others. There are huge varieties of marketed gluten-free foods. The industry took advantage 
with the help of the media and advertising a lot of this. Ingesting a small quantity of 50 milligram gluten per day can cause intestinal damage in these patients. So the strictness should be maximized. Any product that's labeled gluten-free should have proven content list or equal to 20 parts per million. There's nothing completely pure, but in some patients, this may be harmful. This means that symptoms may occur after eating five pounds of gluten-free food, which is not going to, to be eaten. Monitor compliance with gluten-free diet. The necessary strictness may vary among patients. Some patients tolerate little symptoms rather than to be very meticulous in avoidance. But in addition to diagnosis, we should monitor these patients for other comorbid conditions, including high incidence of lymphoma. The third entity the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is a relatively new entity. It's also called non-celiac gluten intolerance, non-celiac wheat sensitivity, non-celiac wheat intolerance, non-celiac disease, non-wheat allergy gluten sensitivity, various terminologies. It doesn't fit with celiac disease or wheat allergy. So the term is applied to subjects who neither have celiac disease or wheat allergy, yet have symptoms, GI or extra-intestinal, that improve after gluten withdrawal. So that is a very loose definition. If the person improves in gluten-free diet, is labeled non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Interest in this began in early 80s. There has been constantly increasing. And still, this area, although clinically exists, is controversial because we don't have an objective evidence for it. Its pathogenesis is not well understood and lacks biomarkers. The involvement of the intestinal microbiome is very likely the cause. That's another buzz word that our bodies, germs, the microbiome control a lot of our body functions in prevention or in treatment of disease. Its estimated prevalence ranges from half to 6% as rising. So celiac disease purely is very, very rare. Wheat allergy is rare, but this is going up. Besides gluten, other wheat proteins and fermentable poorly absorbed short-chain carbohydrates, the fructans, can contribute to these symptoms. So it's still a gray area. So the manifestations of these patients can vary from abdominal pain, dermatitis, headache, foggy mind. Well, I think I'm going to get tested, but there is no test for this to know why I have foggy mind. These symptoms that are loose, vague, soft symptoms, altered bowel habits, fatigue, depression, well, I think academicians will fall into this category. There's exponentially increasing claims of this condition. There are non-specific symptoms, as you notice. It is self-diagnosed. There is no test. There are no good studies were done, well-designed, placebo-controlled. And the power of placebo, this is great. Without it, it will not succeed much in medicine. Thank God for the placebo. And Many times we yield to the patient when say they are improving on a certain regimen as long as it is not a harm of a regimen. No need to disturb the faith of the person as long as we are not doing witchcraft 
and the person has no or not missing a dangerous disease. Gluten is a media's popular topic. Some media dedicated to this. Right? Their magazines are paid for by the industry, full of advertisements and in a very attractive design and paper and colors. The multi-million dollar industry is increasing. So in summary, wheat-related disease, the real ones are the wheat algae and celiac disease, and the undeniable vague gray zone of the non-celiac gluten sensitivity of patients or subjects who say, I feel better. My gastrointestinal tract or my mind or my well-being is better. We cannot argue with that. So to differentiate between these three conditions, the prevalence of wheat allergy is definitely less than half percent, or a celiac disease is much rarer, even in the Northern Europe. In the US, it's very, very rare. We don't know this entity, how prevailing, but so common. The common age can be any age in wheat allergy, but more in children. And celiac disease more in children, much more than in adults. But this condition is more in adults. No child will come complaining of this. The allergen in the wheat allergy is the water-soluble protein. Whereas celiac is water insoluble prolamines, and the non celiac gluten sensitivity can be gluten, can be a carbohydrate, fructan. The mechanism in the wheat allergy is Ig mediated. The celiac disease is primarily T cell mediated. We don't know the mechanism on the third entity. The symptoms of the wheat allergy can be anything, including anaphylaxis. Celiac disease is primarily in the GI, but certain proportion have the dermatitis herpetiformis rash, and failure to thrive, and a variety of autoimmune comorbid conditions. And the non-celiac gluten sensitivity is mainly GI, but can be others even without GI. Screening tests for the wheat allergy is allergy skin testing or blood testing as a screening test. See, like this serology, which is a very high reliability, may be complemented with the HLA haplotypes. There is no test for the third entity. Confirmation of the wheat allergy, if needed, will be a careful, well-designed challenge. And celiac disease confirmation yeah, by biopsy. In certain situations, may be a challenge test be done. And the third entity, we need double-blind placebo-controlled for the child, which is not done. The treatment of wheat allergy is strict avoidance. The morbidity risk is a slight, and the course is temporary. Usually within a few years, will be outgrown. And celiac disease, the treatment, gluten-free diet, the comorbid conditions can be high, and it is a permanent condition. Whereas in the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, again, gluten-free diet will be done. The morbidity varies because we depend on the, what the patient says, symptoms. Of course, we don't know. Even if you convince the person you don't have any problem with gluten, they are not going to listen. I feel good on gluten-free diet. Get off my back, and they will not listen. Let it be. What is the harm of it? They pay money, but they feel good about it. And the more they pay, the more you feel better. What's happening now? Still, I have a few minutes. Why did it stop on me? Kathy, are you playing good?
So now, what do these patients claim and the media repeatedly say it? These are just some that I got from the internet. Turn off from internet or from magazines. Turn off those fat burning genes by eating the right foods like eggs, blah, blah, blah. Of course, anybody who's going to eat a lot of carbohydrate it will gain weight. But they put here a twist in it, fat burning genes. They're blue genes or To regain all the vitality boosting energy, going gluten free can help. Wheat is the source of gastric distress for many, even those who don't suffer from celiac disease. Emulsifiers are often made from gluten and have been associated with an increased risk of colitis. Gluten may be the trigger for leaky gut syndrome. Listen to this. Leaky gut syndrome, which can allow bacteria and the food particles to leak into your abdominal cavity, in the peritoneal cavity, causing nasty symptoms from bloating and belly pain to more serious issues like peritoneal. My God, and even that. Will, who will read this will not go for a gluten-free diet. For endometriosis sufferers, whoa, going gluten-free can make a huge difference. Infertility that has no obvious cause could be the result of undiagnosed celiac, neuropsychiatric disorders, headaches, sleeplessness, cognitive disorder, behavioral problems. If you are depressed, cutting out gluten may help. Gluten-free diets may alleviate some of the symptoms associated with anxiety, certain neuropathy. Many Alzheimer's patients may have a previous undiagnosed. All this is in the media around us. Whereas when you want to publish a scientific paper, you don't find a place for it. Autoimmune disorder claim to gluten. Autoimmune issues, thyroid function. Of course, there's some truth of this. But it's up to the specialist, not in the media, to tell the patient that. Inflammation, skin conditions, cardiovascular function, defenses against germs, even cancer. So isn't it a miracle we are still alive with gluten? With all this in the media around? Well, I have no idea what gluten is either, but I am avoiding it. Just to be a safe side. That's what many people are doing. You find all these gluten-free diet and put the word celiac disease in it and selling that. All this advertisement around. Anything you wanted of gluten-free diet, you'll find it. They are labeling it. That beyond the celiac, now find gluten-free apps for that. So the fouling will continue because you find this advertisement, fit and free. Who doesn't want to be like that? Just put yourself in gluten-free diet. You'll be like her. All natural gluten-free beauty. Whoa. Hey, look at that. All this came from gluten-free? Wow. Gluten in makeup. Raising eyebrows. Therefore, I'm thinking of a gluten-free line of clothes to supplement my salary. Thank you. Yes, sir. If somebody's on a gluten-free diet and is uh, not having any symptoms, is there any place for following uh, uh, the, <clears throat> these antibody levels to see uh, whether uh, if the antibody levels are still high, there could be ongoing damage to the intestinal glucose? 
if these patients were diagnosed with seal or in their own avoided in their own avoided or diagnosed and was recommended of course there are the, the, all these antibodies will go down and if they put the gluten back it will take a few weeks to go up so we it can be used for monitoring actually for compliance if a patient say I'm not feeling better are you compliant with that yes I am we just take like in all times that people who are taking not taking the theophylline and take the blood level and find very low you're not taking and say I took it this morning Patient is following a gluten-free diet feels just fine, uh, but uh, monitoring the antibody levels, the antibody levels are still somewhat high. Is that anything to worry about or not? I don't think it will be high if the person is truly having the disease and avoiding the gluten. That would be low. Do you think, James? We don't monitor if they're doing well. We, we follow like if, it, if they are, say they are following a gluten-free diet and they're having symptoms and then we do the lie detector test and say for the is positive then you can go back and say that there's some cross-contamination. And that's really probably where that occurs. So in the case of Clint, when we talk about cross-contamination, it's having wheat and gluten products inside the home <coughs> and not realizing that they're cross-contaminated. So somebody will make a sandwich and then everything that that is touched is contaminated and that's where the patient goes into a, a contamination aspect. <coughs> Usually when we say gluten-free diet, we eat gluten-free in the household, meaning everybody in the household is gluten-free also. Hey, can you comment, James, uh, on the challenge testing? Is it necessary? How often to be done? So how do you do it? Well, we don't use it that much. In fact, I don't know how to use it. In, in, my re in recent memory. Um, but what happens is sometimes you get patients who come to your clinic who have already decided that they have celiac disease and put themselves on a gluten-free diet. And then you have to dilemma of what do you do in that situation. And generally what is recommended is a slice of bread daily for a week or two weeks and then instead of testing. And that's enough exposure to gluten in order to evaluate that patient from that standpoint. Because you will have some uh, normalization of the B-line on a gluten-free diet. How about repeat the biopsies? And we don't, we have not typically followed that pattern of repeat biopsies. The problem that we see more often in, the di in trying to make the diagnosis is that the B line flattened for some other reason. So not all that flattened is in celiac disease. So you have to think of parasitic infections, particularly if somebody's having diarrhea. If they have a duodenitis uh, that is developed, that will also cause the B line flattening. I've chased after that a few times, not to find celiac disease, but see on a biopsy, uh, feel is flattening and blunting. Uh, those are the things that we see there. The newest trend in the biopsy, which is more of a technical issue for us, than, than it is for general audience is that now we recommend is to take biopsies from the duodenal bulb, not from necessarily all from the, the or in addition to taking from the, the distal part of the duodenal. The reason being is that there's a new entity called ultra short celiac disease that's only seen in the duodenal bulb and it's kind of the opposite of what you think of because you normally think of the worst disease as being part of the in the duodenum uh, and down into the jew, but there, there have been some celiac disease patients who've been picked up just with the biopsy involved. What is the instance or prevalence of celiac disease in our community in the south of the United States here? Um, I don't know that I can quite, you know, it, it's, it's diverse. Yeah. I, I will tell you that we're, the, the GI literature has been full of celiac disease in the last five to 10 years. You, you're missing celiac disease, you're missing celiac disease. But we only <coughs> want maybe two, three, half a dozen celiac disease patients in a year that, that we're seeing or that I know about. So, and we're looking for it because we're also looking at it for somebody who 
has elevated liver chemistry, so no other explanation than we proceed down the pathway to lung disease. So I, I don't know that I know the answer to that, other than we're not seeing the numbers. That but it's a different area. You are six faculty members active all over the area here, and on the average one, one, one patient per faculty member. Right. Yeah. That compared to the people who think have a gluten problem. Right. 